Hello and welcome to a series of messages entitled Jesus' Prophetic Journey to the Cross. We're going to be in John chapter 10 at the very end and moving through a good portion of John chapter 11. And we're mainly going to be highlighting some verses as we read through. We're not going to read the entire chapter. And we're going to look at how Jesus prophetically shows what's going to happen as he moves towards uh, the end of his earthly ministry and becomes the sacrifice for the sins of the world. Heavenly Father, we come before you now giving you thanks and honor and praise for all things. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, who said in your word, in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We thank you that we have your word to study, and we pray that you would bless this time together in your word. And we thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we go back into John chapter 10, we're just going to look at a couple of verses there where Jesus introduces what we're going to see in a good portion of chapter 11. Now, Jesus has just finished having a discussion with some Jews, and they've been challenging him on his authority and so forth. And Jesus says in verse 37, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. He's basically telling them, look, you know the Scriptures. If I'm not doing the things that God wants to have done, that God the Father wants to have done, then don't believe me. You have the Scriptures. You know what is required of Messiah to do while he's on earth. But, verse 38, but if I do though you believe not me, in other words, if you don't believe me as a man, the man standing in front of you now, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Back in verse 30 of the same chapter, he said, I and my Father are one. And this was the thing that really set them off because he's making himself equal with God and they had a problem with that. They couldn't see that he was, in fact, the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures concerning Messiah. And Jesus has demonstrated that, in fact, proven that numerous times. And I don't have time to go through those proofs in this brief message, but the gospel according to Matthew is an excellent example. It's a complete record, virtually, of the uh, prophecies in the Old Testament that have been fulfilled in Jesus because Matthew was writing to the Jew. And so he was showing the Jewish person who would understand the Old Testament scriptures who Jesus was and why he was the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures concerning Messiah. Now as we move into chapter 11, this is the story of Lazarus. Now, when we focus on Lazarus, we're really amazed by the fact that Lazarus was a man whom Jesus loved. He was very close to him. He was very close to the whole family. Mary, Martha, Lazarus. He knew them quite well. He was very endeared to them. And when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he he took an unusual course of action which did not make sense to his disciples nor to Mary and Martha, uh, who were Lazarus's sisters. But it all had a specific purpose. And we're going to look at at least a part of that purpose in this first message. And then we're going to get in the meat of that in the next message as we approach the, the Easter day. So let's begin in uh, verse 1. We will read the first 
four verses. And then we're just going to kind of skip across the pond with our little skipping stone and highlight certain key verses that, uh, that make our point clear. So now, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 11, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So now Mary has been identified. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. So just in these first three verses, we see this, this kinship, this, this closeness that Mary, Martha, and Jesus and Lazarus have together. They are not strangers. All right. Of course, Jesus knows the hearts of all men. Even in his incarnate form, he knows this, but he is even endeared to them even so much more. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and we're going to see that as we move along. Now in verse 4, here is a key. Here is one of our first keys. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, notice, it's very important. We ask this question all the time. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do people who commit themselves to be doctors, to be public servants, uh, to be uh, preachers, to be missionaries, to do all sorts of wonderful things for people, end up getting horrible, horrible illnesses, end up in, in very difficult situations, end up with family struggles, sometimes even financial struggles through no control of their own. Why do they end up in these terrible situations? Why do they end up with these horrible diseases that nobody should even have to suffer through? This is us thinking now in our, in our human mind, in our, in our worldly mindset, I should say. But we have to remember God has a much, much bigger picture and a much, much bigger plan. You know, I often think of Gideon, who started out with a pretty large army, and God kept paring it down till he had a mere 300 men. Uh, I wouldn't have done it that way, but I'm not God. And in the end, Gideon's army didn't even have to fight those, those huge armies that they were going to be coming up against. Uh, these people in the night basically got scared and killed themselves. And Gideon's army basically just went in and, and mopped up a, a few stragglers. And that was it. That was all he had to do. God takes care of things. He does things to show himself mighty. He has a purpose. There were a lot of people that suffered and that were suffering in Jesus's time that Jesus healed. It was wonderful that they were healed, but too many people focus on the healings and don't focus on the glory of God. He was there to fulfill the Old Testament scripture showing who he was and why he was there to reach the end goal of dying for the sins of mankind. Literally the sin of mankind, which is rejecting God. I will read verse 5 here too. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, and that would be Mary, and Lazarus, okay? And then he does something really odd in verse 6, or so it seems. It's not odd when you look back on it and see why, but in verse 6, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, that is Lazarus, he abode two days still in that same place where he was. Then after that, he said to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. Right. So he actually stayed there two more days, knowing that he had some travel time and so forth. Lazarus was already sick. He knew Lazarus was sick, and yet he waited. All right. He had a reason for waiting. All right. Remember, this is all for the glory of God. And this is all going to be a picture of who Jesus is in his purpose for coming to the world 
and suffering and dying for mankind, for our sin. Okay. We're going to move down now to verse 9. And he says, when the, his disciples ask him, why are we going to Judea? He says, are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Now, this is not just about light and darkness. You go out at nighttime, you bump into things, because you, if you don't have a flashlight, if you don't have a torch, if you don't have something to light the way, to light your path, a lantern or something then you can't really see very well. If it's a starry night or an overcast night, especially, it's very dark. Jesus is speaking about the darkness of the heart, the sinful heart, the ungodly heart, the heart that does not know God. We're told in John 1, 9 that Jesus is the true light. He is preparing to shine light upon the world. And Lazarus is going to be one of those doors he's going, to, he's going to open, or Lazarus is going to be one of those tools he's going to use to open that door and shine the light on the world and show people that, yes, he is even a much greater light than people up to this point have realized. You see, his disciples knew that there were plots out against him to kill him. And they still don't understand that he needs to be sacrificed, that he, they don't understand Isaiah 53 yet. They're not going to understand Isaiah 53 until after the fact, until well after the fact, actually. Isaiah 53, of course, speaks of Jesus' suffering and death for our sakes. So, in verses 9 and 10, we have Jesus speaking of the true light and the fact that men don't have light in them. They need that light. They need the truth. They need, specifically, they need Jesus. And Jesus then makes the statement that really just cuts to the chase. He starts talking about Lazarus' condition. In verse 11, he says, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now the disciples, when they first heard the word sleep, they said, oh, he's resting good. He's doing well. Maybe he'll rest. Maybe he'll recover. Maybe he'll do better. They didn't understand what Jesus meant. So down in verse 14, Jesus makes one of the most plain statements in all of Scripture. He said to them, Lazarus is dead. We're going to stop there, and we're going to pick up right at that point with the next message and begin speaking about what happened to Lazarus and how it tells us about what's going to happen to Jesus. Until next time, stay in his word and stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.